You're listening to The Law Lads Project. I'm your host, Angie Vishianan. I'm a lawyer that launched a startup focused on changing the legal profession through mentorship. Through this podcast, we will explore the early career steps of real lawyers to help students see that many of us didn't have it all figured out at first. It takes time to find your way in the profession, so we want to shed light on some of the challenges people face in the earliest part of building their careers. Each week, I sit down with members of the legal profession and chat with them about the paths they took to get where they are now, including the times they stumbled, the times they fell, and the times they needed a little help. To encourage candor and vulnerability on this show, the attorney guests will remain nameless, but their stories will be laid bare for your consideration. If you've done any LSAT prep at all, you've probably noticed that getting ready for the LSAT is approximately as much fun as fighting off a pack of feral dogs barehanded. But Velocity LSAT is here to change that for you by making you faster, better, stronger, and also able to outwit any feral dogs in the area. Velocity is the online video course taught by me, Dave Hall, the guy with all the 180s. At Velocity, we guarantee you'll hit the 99th percentile or improve by at least 10 points or we'll keep working with you until you do. Law Lives listeners can get half off your first month's installment or $100 off a year's subscription. Just enter code LAWLIVES, L-A-W-L-I-V-E-S, all one word, at checkout. Enroll, get more details, and contact info at VelocityLSAT.com. Hi, I'm Samina. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm planning to go to law school, and I'm interning for Leg Up Legal. In today's episode, I'm sitting down with a criminal defense attorney who owns her own firm in North Carolina. We'll also discuss her transition from working as a prosecutor to owning her own criminal defense firm. Let's dive right in. So my first question is, what were the reasons that you decided to go to law school? That was something I had thought about pretty much my whole life. For me, it was figuring out whether I wanted to go to law school, go to medical school, but I had always wanted to be a lawyer. That was always something that I had in my mind. And after college, it was pretty much like, all right, well, what's next? I guess it's going to be law school. I had majored in political science and philosophy in college, um, and law school was kind of a natural next step. Did you go straight to law school, like after graduating from college, or did you take a gap year or anything like that? Yeah, I took one year off and went home and worked some different jobs, took some road trips, did that sort of fun stuff, and then got my applications in order for law school. So how did you decide which law school to go to? I was looking mainly at state schools, and I actually ended up taking a year off because my initial round of applications, I did my senior year of college but I got waitlisted everywhere that I applied. And I still, when I applied the second time, I still only focused on state schools that were going to be less expensive. I had an idea that I did want to be a prosecutor. I didn't want to have my career dictated by debt that I was going to have to pay off. Um, I didn't want to have to make career decisions based on what I owed. Um, And so really going to a state school was of the utmost importance to me and my financial independence. Were there a few things that you wish you knew before going to law school? Maybe. I feel like I maybe psyched myself out a little bit. You know, I read the books like 1L and and things like that. And I started thinking, wow, is this going to be some kind of really crazy competitive atmosphere where folks are ripping pages out of books in the library. And then I realized that wasn't how things were at my law school. And there was actually a very collegial atmosphere. People were very willing to help each other. Um, Professors were willing to help. And it it all came together and worked out really well. You know, I certainly knew that law school was going to be challenging. You know, at that point, I was 23 years old. I decided to live home with my mom. I was able to live home with my mom and commute to law school every day. Um, to save money. And of course, you know, for most 23 year olds, the last thing you want to do, or at least when I was 23, was the last thing people wanted, I wanted to do is, is go home and live with my mom. But looking back, it was one of the, definitely one of the smartest things I could have done just by way of the amount of money that I was able to save. And that I only, you know, had to loan money for tuition as opposed to living expenses, which are really where you're going to take the, you know, massive hit in, in, in getting into debt. Um, if you could have like chosen a different law school, like if you could go back and do that, would you have? Actually, no. Um, I did not go to a top tier law school. It was a state school, but it was actually the best experience I could have imagined. It is actually a historically black college university, which was a neat thing for me to experience also as a white person. And just being able to have that kind of daily dialogue with folks um, who are a little bit different than me, 
Um, it was invaluable. Um, it taught me how we all have so much more in common than we don't have in common. Um, it was fantastic. And the fact that I'm still close to so many people that I went to law school with, I, I just, I really wouldn't trade that experience for the world. Um, the professors I had were top notch. There were most, every professor that I had actually was either actively practicing or had actively practiced law. And so in every class, we got a real good taste of actual things that happen, you know, in the practice of law, in court, in dealing with clients. And I've heard experiences and stories from other people who have attended other law schools where that wasn't necessarily the case. And you have professors who have been professors their entire life and the academic career is the only career that they had. And, you know, that's certainly that's fine. But for somebody I knew who I wanted to be in the courtroom and I wanted to be litigating having people that I could learn from who had actually been there and done that was so incredibly important to me. And I'm so happy for that experience and for those professors that I had who were able to contribute not only to my you know, book learning, if you will, uh, but to sort of give me a much better, well-rounded, practical approach, especially with clinic courses. I was able to get such a good grip on uh, the practical aspect of legal uh, work as well. And that was really invaluable. And so I would really encourage folks to find the professors at your school. If it's not everybody, find the ones who have practiced or who are actively practicing and take classes with them um, because you're going to learn a lot more than just what's in the textbook. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds like an amazing experience though. Wow, that's really good advice. Uh, did you participate in any extracurricular activities in law school? I did. I wrote on to the law review after my first year of law school. And then my third year, I served as articles editor of the law review. So that took up a lot of time. Um, I also participated in our school's criminal law clinic, which was comprised of a classroom course, as well as an externship, which I did at the district attorney's office in the next county over from my law school. And so I got to you know, try cases under the third year practice rule and do things like that while I was still in law school, which was really, really neat. Was it hard to find like time for all of that? A little bit. It wasn't too bad. I think um, some of my classmates laughed at me that I would come to school in a suit every day and I probably spent more time in the DA's office than I did at school. But as soon as class was over, most days I would get in my car and drive over to the DA's office, depending on my schedule, and definitely spent a lot of time in real court too. Wow, that's really cool, though. Um, so it was fun, and I, I probably didn't, I probably stayed away from moot court because I was doing too much in real court. <laughs> <laughs> so what jobs um, or internships and activities did you do between your 1L and 2L year? The DA's office. Oh. So I started working in the DA's office the summer after first year, and I actually continued working there until I graduated. Oh, okay. And then did you do that between your 2L and 3L year, too? Yep, I, I continued working. So during the school year, and then between second and third year, and then it, during the second and between the second and third year, I actually was still working there, but I was able to secure an IOLTA grant, which was neat. So I was in essence getting paid for working in the DA's office. And sometimes, you know, with the public service internships or externships, it can be hard to get a paid position. So it was nice to have a little stipend. So did your like internship kind of turn into like your like an offer eventually? So it did not because in that particular office, they, there was not a misdemeanor court position that didn't open up. Um, at the time that I was had passed the bar. Uh, but what it did lead to was it led to my supervisor, who was that elected district attorney, being able to put in a good word when I applied to a district two counties away. Oh, okay, cool. So um, is that so that's kind of how you applied for your for your job? Sure. So I applied, yeah, I applied to many, many DA's offices in my state, uh, most all of the major um, cities and metropolitan areas. And the experience that I had from interning for over two years in that other DA's office during law school proved to be invaluable because I could go into an interview and say, hey, look, I've been in our misdemeanor court trying cases, you know, working the kinks out. Like I'm already trained. I can hit the ground running. I know what I'm doing. I know this is where I want to be. And that was really, really helpful. Could you like kind of describe like what kind of work you did? I would go to court with the DAs. I would call the calendar. I would negotiate traffic tickets with uh, pro se individuals who were coming into court without a lawyer. I would negotiate cases with lawyers as well. I would try all different kinds of misdemeanor cases with one of the assistant DAs sitting with me, of course, um, supervising me. 
but I would try everything from, you know, domestic assault cases, uh, even tried some DWI cases. Um, so it was, I got to have a real taste of everything. And again, kind of like work the kinks out so that when I got to my first job, um, I passed the bar in July, was hired at my first job in October. Mm -hmm. And I kind of walked in and, and, you know, people were like, oh, you already, you already know how to do this. And so it was, it was a nice way to make a really good impression very quickly. Wow. And I'm like, I guess, how did you decide that you wanted to like go into that specific field? Um, you know, I can't remember when it was or sort of how that came about. But when I was interning in the DA's office um, under a phenomenal elected district attorney, you know, we would, we would talk about the philosophy of prosecution and we would talk about the criminal justice system. And one of the things that always stuck with me was the realization that no matter how hard a defense attorney works and fights for their client, at the end of the day, a prosecutor is the only person who can sign a dismissal form, right? So if you see some great miscarriage of justice or some, uh, something, a wrong that needs to be righted, right? A prosecutor is the person whose signature can undo all of that. And, you know, with that obviously comes great responsibility, uh, but it just made me realize what an important role prosecutors play in, in society. And I really, really enjoyed being able to have a positive impact on the system like that. Looking back, do you think that you chose the right practice area? I definitely think I did. And, you know, spoiler alert, I'm not a prosecutor anymore, but um, I'm a defense attorney. But all of that foundation laid the groundwork. And I like to tell people that my personal philosophy is there may be two sides in a criminal case, but there's one constitution. And the different sides are just different sets of eyes looking over the same set of facts and the same set of circumstances. They're checks and balances, making sure that the constitution is followed and that the rules are followed and that our criminal, our way of life and our criminal procedure is followed. And so being a prosecutor for so long laid an incredibly solid foundation uh, for me to be able to move very seamlessly over to the other side. What kind of made you wanna switch from being a prosecutor to a defense attorney? I have thought about it many times over the years, and I honestly, I never quite had the nerve to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I was scared, and you know, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was, I was scared. I was nervous. You know, I'd never run a business. That was, I didn't do numbers. That was entirely outside of my wheelhouse. You know, I went to law school because I didn't have to do math or do <laughs> numbers. And one of the other things that I really feel strongly about is volunteering and volunteer work. And I joined the Junior League of Greensboro back in 2006, and that is a charitable organization that promotes volunteerism, developing the potential of women, and improving the community um, through the effective action and leadership of trained volunteers. And I was privileged enough to serve as president of my Junior League in 2018 to 2019, and that, um, that changed my life. Um, the training that I was able to get in being a CEO and running, you know, an 800 member plus corporation, that was huge. And when I did that, and I was able to do that um, successfully, and I said to myself, you know what, I just did this, there is no reason on earth why I can't open my own law firm. And it was life changing, that realization. And so I realized, you know, I need to go ahead and do this. At that point, I've been a prosecutor for 15 years. And I just said to myself, you know, this could be the biggest success. It could be the most colossal failure, but I need to go and do this so that when I'm like 90 years old, I'm not looking back and wondering if I should have done this or why didn't I do this or I should have taken a chance. And, you know, if I crash and burn, I crash and burn, I move on, I, I you know, get back on the horse and find something else. But it's, it's been a big success. Oh, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, was it like really difficult though to like at the beginning to kind of like start your own business and like figure things out and do all of that? Um, not actually, not really, not not as complicated as you'd think. Um, you know, I got a friend who is a Excel spreadsheet wizard, and she put together spreadsheets for me. You know, to track to track um, expenses and to track income, and I just got very diligent about you know making all my entries and and balancing things out and it actually, it actually hasn't been bad at all. And I'm by nature, somebody who is pretty outgoing. And so talking to people isn't really an issue for me. 
I've been able to, you know, get a lot of referrals, people who, you know, I had very good working relationships, even with the defense attorneys um, that I had worked with when I was a prosecutor. And the defense bar has really accepted me um, kind of with open arms. And it's been, it's been really great. Um, is there anything that you kind of wish you knew before you started running your own business? No, I, I think... I think I pretty much, I think I went in with my eyes um, pretty wide open. I think I didn't realize just how amazing it is to work for yourself. <laughs> um, learned that one pretty quickly. But I think on the flip side, that can also be, you know, there are, I think there are some, there are some personality types who um, might need to proceed with caution in that respect as well. You know, I spent 15 years running on, you know, DA standard time, as I like to call it. So, you know, I was at my office by 815. I was in, you know, in court by 830 or nine. Um, and I still very much adhere to the times, to, to those sorts of timetables. You know, I'm always at my office by 8, 815 in the morning, mm -hmm. always headed to the courthouse by 830. And so that discipline from so many years of working for somebody else is very helpful at this point in my life because sure, you know, I have the freedom. I can go run some errands at lunchtime if I need to. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean I'm going to take like every Thursday off and go play golf. It's because I think there, there's a fine line, I think, between, you know, having the freedom to do something and whether or not it's probably like prudent or, or a good idea um, mm -hmm. to actually go ahead and do it. Um, you know, certainly you have to give yourself grace and, and engage in that kind of self-care when you need it. But, um, it can be easy, I think, for the, for somebody with the wrong personality type to go off the rails with that much freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like I could never do that. <laughs> I would need the structure. Yeah. Um, so I guess, like, how many um, hours do you typically work in a week? So that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't want to scare any listeners. But for me, it's like, because I work for myself, a lot of times the work spills over into home, which is fine for me. Um, you know, whether it's answering phone calls, um, my... My office line is actually a second line on my cell phone. So it, it, sometimes it rings in the evenings, at night, on the weekends. And, you know, certainly I can screen what calls I'm taking, what calls I'm not taking. Um, I can also text people. So I end up, and, you know, I might say to myself, I might leave work an hour early and go home and do some work later tonight. So sometimes it, it does bleed over and it's kind of like a constant thing, but it never feels oppressive in any way, if that makes sense. I would say I probably work... 60, maybe 60 hours a week. Mm, okay. And like, how much of that time would you say you spend interacting with clients directly? A, a very large majority of that. Mm -hmm. um, whether it is having consults in my office or via Zoom, or whether it is meeting with clients at the jail, um, because I have a lot of high level felony clients who are incarcerated right now, um, or being in court and dealing with clients, mm -hmm. um, a very large percentage of my every day is, is talking to people and dealing with clients um, or, you know, pro my opposing counsel, um, which are all prosecutors. And then how much time would you say you spend in court though? A lot. Um, <laughs> and I love court, but yeah, most, because most every day I have court appearances and generally it's in the morning, a little less frequently in the afternoon, unless there's a trial, but obviously we haven't had trials since March. So. Oh yeah. How has that been going? Like, how have you been doing things? So it's been interesting. Um, in our state, basically our misdemeanor courts have been shut down except for first appearances for criminal cases and, you know, emergency domestic violence orders in civil court. And our felony courts never really fully shut down, certainly because, you know, there's due process issues, there's bond motions and things like that. And, mm -hmm. and certainly colleagues and I were, you know, filing a lot of bond motions during the height of COVID, trying to get people out of jail. But luckily, most of my practice is our high-level felonies um, and felony practice. And since those courts never really shut, um, I was able to keep going and keep working. Um, mm -hmm. And actually having that routine has really been everything. It has been everything. It has really helped me survive this, this six months. I think if I, had, I was in a position where I had to stay home all day, it would have been, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I don't know that I could have done that. I really don't know. Um, but it was a situation too where I just had to you know, put a mask on, go to the jail, see my clients, deal with things, and just do the best I could um, in terms of taking precautions. And it was, it was helpful for me to be able to think about other people and about how they needed help. And that really helped me handle and manage kind of my fear.
This episode is sponsored by Crescendo. Crescendo helps law students crush finals, the MPRE, and the bar. With hundreds of mnemonics and illustrations, thousands of official NCBE practice questions, affordable pricing, lifetime access, whiteboard videos, plus audio outlines and audio flashcards, Crescendo is revolutionizing legal education. Unlike some competitors who require expensive deposits, Crescendo offers the opposite, a 30-day, no questions asked, money back guarantee. Most everyone sticks around. The five-star reviews explain why you should try Crescendo. Matthew from Harvard said he wished he had Crescendo as a 1L. Kimberly from BYU said it's tricky business to concisely explain and teach such a vast amount of information, and Crescendo does so in an entertaining, easy-to-listen-to way. Ryan from ASU said he's convinced that Crescendo is the very best way to memorize black-letter law. Visit crescendo.com to learn more. That's C-R-U-S-H-E-N-D-O dot com. Now, back to the episode. So what are some like discrete tasks that you have to do for your job? So I do, well, first of all, I pretty much do all my admin stuff myself. Um, I don't have any full-time, I've got a part-time assistant. I don't have a full-time assistant. Jail visits, I have to go on jail visits, um, which are fine. I don't mind it at all. To me, that's one of our highest callings as defense attorneys. Um, You know, we, we are the physical embodiment of the Sixth Amendment. Um, for our clients and especially our clients who are incarcerated and and need that link because we're the only kind of link a lot of them have uh, Mm -hmm. to the outside at that point. In terms of other tasks, really, um, you know, consulting with new clients, um, explaining the court process. And certainly my explanations can be pretty long. Um, As somebody who worked as part of the system for so long, um, I have the great luxury of being able sort of to explain every single piece in the puzzle of what's going to happen. Like, this is what happens first, then it, then we're going to see this happen, and then the DA is going to do this, and then this, and then this. You know, consults, administrative tasks, um, of course, negotiating, going to the DA's office, meeting with opposing counsel um, about cases, uh, trying to negotiate deals for my clients, um, going to court, appearing in front of judges, um, whether it's for trials, whether it's for uh, guilty pleas, um, speaking to family members of, of defendants as well. Um, you know, that can be a whole, that can be a whole uh, task on its own sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly when you have concerned family members, sometimes it takes just as much time with them as it does with your client, um, especially in those high level cases to make sure they understand, of course, if your client's given permission for you to talk to them um, about what's going on so that they can know because of course I don't like any of my clients in jail speaking to anybody about their cases on the phone. Yeah. Um, and then I guess most of your clients are individuals, right? And yep, individuals charged with crimes from anything from murder to traffic tickets. What are like the five best things about your job? I love helping people. I love helping people. That is one of the best things about my job. Um, and it's a little bit different, you know, as a prosecutor, Um, You certainly get to help people too, but as a defense attorney, you really get to do a deep dive and help people in a really big way on a very individual basis. Um, I love the autonomy and the independence that comes with owning my own business. Um, At this point, honestly, I don't know if I could ever go back to work for somebody else ever again um, because I, I love it that much. And it's, I just really, I can't say enough good things about it. And so I really encourage people, if you're thinking about it, if you have an inkling that that's what you want to do at some point, you should take a chance on yourself because investing in yourself and taking a chance on yourself, I mean, that was the best decision I ever literally had ever made. But I think also another great thing about my job is that I have a really good command of the law. When I think about running a business and practicing law, they're two very different hats, right? So one, I'm a CEO of a business, but also I'm a practicing lawyer. And I, sometimes I have to take off one hat, put on the other. I have so much respect for people who go out on their own very, very early in their career. I also think that would be incredibly difficult uh, because not only are you navigating the waters and learning how to be a CEO, but you're also learning the law. Um, And at least I like the fact of having the luxury of knowing the law very well. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I'm a board certified specialist in my practice area and I have a very good grip of it. And I, I start thinking, wow, I can't imagine seriously having to learn both of those things at the same time. 
-hmm. I think that would be such a big challenge. Is it hard kind of switching between those two roles though as like a CEO and an attorney? Um, it, it can be. Sometimes I have to say to myself, all right, you got to put this file away. It's, you got to get on QuickBooks now and, um, and, and <laughs> do, some, do some business stuff. Time to put the law away, um, do some business things. And I know, you know, people who run much bigger firms a lot of times have, you know, dedicated employees that handle that business side as like a firm manager or things like that. And so maybe hopefully one day. <laughs> Um, I guess since I asked you what the five best things were, or what are the five worst things about your job? So I don't know if there's, for me, I don't know if there are five. I think there's, there's a couple that I've had to get used to. I'll put it this way. One is definitely isolation. I went from a situation where there were 33 other lawyers in my office. You know, I could pop into anybody's office at any time and sit down and say, hey, you know, let me run this set of facts by you. What are your thoughts about this case? And having people around at all times um, to the point where sometimes I would go home at night and say, oh my God, I'm so glad I can just be in peace right now and lay down on my couch and it's quiet and I don't have to talk to anybody. Um, and I realized that I, I miss that sometimes. So that isolation can be difficult. And when I first went out on my own, I was renting an office in a building where I just had a very small office by myself. Um, and that was extremely isolating. That was actually very difficult. And then in May of this year, I um, received an invitation from an, a, a colleague who had a space, um, had some office space open up in his office suite and asked if I wanted to come take a look at it. And I said, oh, sure. I love that building. You know, it's right across the street from the courthouse. It's gorgeous inside. And it's so nice now sharing an office suite with somebody else and having a little bit more of that, that connection. And of course, I always seek out, you know, colleagues to talk to. So you just have to sort of figure out how you replace all, all of what you had before in terms of, of the people around. Um, the other thing that has been the biggest challenge for me as a prosecutor turning to, into a defense attorney has been learning how to deal with the power balance and the power shift that I experienced. As a prosecutor, you have all of the power. You have the power to calendar cases whenever you want to. You're the one off making a plea offer to the defense. You have the power over so much and the defense has the power over just about nothing. Um, the only thing really within my power is just my knowledge of the law and how well I can use it to help my client. And so going from having all of the power to basically having absolutely none, that was very hard to adjust to. And it's still, I think it's still a process. Um, but those are the two things that stand out to me as being definitely the most challenging things. And I think, I wouldn't call them like worst, they've just definitely been challenges that I've had to kind of adapt to um, and work with. And I think the only other things really that I would say, you know, when you are running it yourself, there's never anybody else kind of to do things for you. <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine with me 99% of the time. But then, you know, every, every blue moon, there's, there's a day when I'm just like, I just, I just don't want to do this today. <laughs> um, but I never, but I never wish that I made a different decision. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's not something that's, that's really bad. It's just, you know, no days off, but that's fine with me. Cause that's sort of just how I am anyway, no days off. And, and I worked on weekends when I was a prosecutor too. And so I, that doesn't bother me one bit. <laughs> Oh, so what are a few things that even other lawyers don't know about your practice area? I think, and I don't want to, I don't want to paint with a broad brush and engage in too many generalizations, but I've, I've experienced over my 16 years of practice, I've experienced times when I've spoken with civil attorneys who, I don't know that I would necessarily use the word condescend, but they might make assumptions that criminal law is easier than civil law. Um, and, and my answer to that is always really, look, anytime somebody can lose their liberty, <laughs> that's a really big deal. And one of my things that I'm kind of famous for telling people is, look, if you have a civil client that comes to you with a criminal matter, you need to find them a criminal attorney. Um, you need to find someone that specializes in that, that that's what they do every single day to go and take care of it. I always say, I don't, I don't dabble in divorces. I don't dabble in mergers and acquisitions. I don't dabble in writing wills. I don't do any of that. All I do, I'm a criminal law practitioner and that's all I do is defend people from criminal charges. Um, and so I just, I, I wish that, you know, that everybody felt the same um, in, in terms of making sure that they're directing clients 
to lawyers in the appropriate practice area um, mm -hmm. for whatever issues they have, because you can get into some real severe consequences. And I, when I was a prosecutor, I saw lawyers come in more uh, semi-frequently uh, to court where they really were a little bit out of their depth um, in criminal court. Even traffic tickets can have some severe consequences if they're not handled correctly. And so it's sort of just incumbent on us as attorneys to make sure that we're guiding people um, to, the, to the lawyers who can best help them with whatever particular issue they have going on. That makes sense. Have you experienced any like major setbacks in your career that you've had to overcome? Um, no, no, really nothing, nothing more than, you know, cases not turning out the way I wanted them to or expected them to. Uh, luckily, no massive, no massive setbacks. What are some of the leading bar associations or professional organizations uh, for your practice area or industry? The, I'm trying to think, well, I guess the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers um, is a big one. And well, I guess the American Bar Association, which I don't actually belong to. <laughs> I never, I never, I never joined as a prosecutor and I still haven't as a defense attorney. And as far as professional organizations, really, I belong to my state's, you know, mandatory bar. I, I don't belong to our voluntary bar, uh, but local professional organizations, like I belong to our two local bars, um, because that's, I think that's very important in terms of uh, networking and meeting people at a local level. You know, not only is it good for business by way of referrals and networking, um, but it's just good to meet people in your community who are out there as practitioners as well. And then the more people I know, the better, if, you know, if I have a, you know, criminal clients who say to me, I need help with this particular area of law, then I have a database of people I can draw from um, mm -hmm. and again, guide people to who, the best person equipped to help them. What character traits do you think that someone in like a position like yours needs to have in order to excel? Well, you definitely have to be incredibly organized, um, especially if you, you know, you're starting a business. You know, you could go be a good criminal defense attorney working for somebody else and you wouldn't have to necessarily have that organization, organizational skill. Mm -hmm. But if you're running your own practice, you need to be keeping your books. Uh, you need to be recording everything. You need to be writing stuff down. Um, you need to be diligent in, in looking things over. Um, you know, you need to keep track of your calendars. All of those organizational skills that I learned and, and did as a prosecutor for so long um, have really, really come in handy. I think you also need to be at a point where even if you're scared, you're, you're getting past that and you're able to, to dig in, tap into some fearlessness and, and step out. Because it's a scary thing to leave behind what you know, like a steady paycheck, um, you know, insurance is a big thing for a lot of people and to kind of leave that all behind and say, I'm, I'm going to take a step out and I'm going to, I'm going to jump. And you kind of have to be at a point where you're okay with, you know, just the thought of hey, if this doesn't go my way, I'll, I'll adapt, I'll pivot, I'll find something else, but I really just want to give this a shot. Mm -hmm. What are some things that law students can do to meet or network with other lawyers or legal professionals in your practice area? I think one of the things that is um, essential is going to court. And even if you're just going to court and observing, um, if you're doing an internship or an externship, I would highly recommend with a prosecutor's office or a public defender's office, um, and even more so a prosecutor's office, because the volume of cases that prosecutors are trying in misdemeanor courts is huge. And there are so many, they will let, you know, they let their interns, like they let me do it back when I was an intern a long time ago. Even our prosecutor's office here, you know, they let third year certified law students do it. They'll let you try cases. And there is nothing like having real life trial experience. And that can help you meet other people. You'll meet other lawyers. You'll get a chance to showcase your skills. Um, and having that opportunity is huge too, because that helps you also get into a job, say in a prosecutor's office. When I have, when I have a law student say to me, you know, I want to be a criminal defense attorney. What's the first career move I should make? I will tell people the prosecutor's office, even if you stay for two or three years, go do it. You're going to try hundreds of cases real fast. Um, and, and you're going to have that experience and you're going to feel confident um, in your trial ability and your trial skills. Um, and that's going to serve you so well. And it's going to serve your clients so well when you're on the other side. Um, do you have any other advice for law students who want to follow in your career path? My advice really it kind of, it kind of piggybacks off of what I was just talking about, but that good defense attorneys and good prosecutors are really 
after the same thing that um, for, for the law to be followed and for procedures to be followed correctly as well. There is so much carryover from one side to the other. Um, and I think if you are a good advocate and a good lawyer, you'll be a good lawyer on either side. The practical application of law is everything. So especially people who are in school right now who are trying to figure things out, take that deep dive. Again, talk to those professors who actually practice. Be like participate in your school's clinical program. It's so important to get that practical experience. That would just be some of my <laughs> some of my <laughs> advice for anybody who's currently in school right now. Yeah, that's really good advice. Mm -hmm. I guess my final question for you is like looking back on your career, have you ever faced like discrimination in the legal field because you're a woman? I have I, I don't know that I would necessarily call it discrimination, but I have been treated differently at times for being a woman. I have been spoken to differently for being a woman. A number of years ago, probably I'd say maybe over 10 years ago, um, there was a visiting judge who came from out of town who was not a fan of women lawyers in our felony courts, um, was not a fan of not only women lawyers, but especially women lawyers wearing pants to court. There is still some of that that's alive and well in, in various parts of the country. And you know, I, I'm from the South, and so um, I don't know if that's more prevalent here or not, but definitely I have been spoken to uh, in ways that I think my male counterparts were not spoken to, um, you know, even by defense attorneys when I was a much younger prosecutor, having to, you know, pat my shoulder, touch me, and um, things where I couldn't really say, like, get your hands off me, please stop that. And you just feel like you sort of have to smile and say, okay, Mr. So and so. Nothing that rose to any sort of reportable or criminal thing, but um, and it was never, you know, my coworkers. But I think that anybody of, of my age has probably experienced a little bit of that in, in this profession, and especially, too, because the area of law where I practice is predominantly male. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot fewer women in high-level criminal litigation. You know, I think family law, it might, I think it looks completely different, or at least it looks completely different here in my area, where most of, most of the practitioners, I would say, are probably women. But in criminal law, it's a little bit different. <laughs> I guess, like, how have you addressed that, though, like, throughout your career? Um, I've always just remained as professional as possible, just sort of, and I don't, I don't know if this is good or bad, but just the realization that it, it might just be this way a little bit, and I just need to work extra hard um, to make sure that everybody knows that the results I get and, and what I'm doing are because I work hard and I'm good at what I do. Those are all the questions I had for you today. Thank you so much for participating. Sure. Thank you so much, Samina, for having me. All right, everyone. That's it for today. Thank you to our guest speaker, and thank you to all of you for listening to another episode of The Law Lives Project. If you're a prospective law student that's interested in speaking with attorneys one-on-one, -on -one, check out leguplegal.com. Legup Legal is an online mentoring platform that connects prospective law students with attorney mentors. Sign up for a membership today to learn more about the practice of law and see if it's a good fit for you. If you enjoyed this episode, I would appreciate it if you left a review on iTunes or any other platform that you're listening on. If you have any questions or comments about anything you heard on the podcast, or if you have ideas for guest speakers, please contact me by emailing me and my team at info at Thanks again, and don't forget to tune in next week.